Good morning and welcome this long Sunday as we look at the week ahead and consider next Sunday the glorious truth of the resurrection. There's much cause for us to rejoice as believers today, knowing that we serve a risen, a living Savior. I'm going to open our service with our call to worship this morning. Several verses have been selected from Psalm 136, verses 3 and 4, and then verses 23 and 24, and we read there, O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. Down to verse 23, who remembered us in our low estate, for his mercy endureth forever. And hath redeemed us from our enemies, for his mercy endureth forever. This phrase, for his mercy endureth forever, appears in the book of Psalms a handful of other times, but rather lengthy number of times, as it is the last half of each verse here in Psalm 136. Psalm 106, 1, Psalm 107, 1. The first four verses of Psalm 118 and the last verse of that chapter, verse 29, all end with this same phrase, for his mercy endureth forever. Mm -hmm. Got to think as the translators got to this passage, if it would have been me, I'd say, you take the first half of the verse, I'll take the last half. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it probably worked that way, but obviously this is a psalm about the endurance mm -hmm. of God's mercy. And if we just take a quick look at the, the psalm, I'll come back to the first three verses, but verses four to nine have to deal with God's mercy enduring through creation. Mm -hmm. You sit there and think, how is God's mercy enduring in creation? Yes, that sixth day God created man, <laughs> but that sixth day he created us. Mm -hmm. All the way back in creation, God's mercy started for you and me. If the creation never took place, none of this is here. Mm -hmm. We don't exist. We would never know God's love. We would never know a Savior. God's mercy indeed was present in creation. And of course, we look out at the created world around us, and it speaks volumes of God's mercy as we look at it. Then verses 10 through 15 talk about God's mercy in the deliverance of his people, Israel, out of bondage in Egypt. And of course their picture for us as believers, we were redeemed and bought out of bondage as well once we trusted Christ as our Savior. Then in verses 16 to 22, we see God's mercy enduring through the wilderness journey all the way up to the uh, conquest of Canaan. And then in verses 23 through 25, we see God's ongoing provision of mercy beyond that. Obviously, this is a psalm that focuses on Israel, but we see application for ourselves. And as our call to worship, I want to go back to verse 1, where we read, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. O oh, give thanks unto Jehovah, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Yahweh, I am Jehovah, the self-existent one. Verse 2, O oh, give thanks unto the God of gods. Israel, a nation taken in idolatry time and time again. We see capital G, God, Elohim, of God's small g. They are all beneath him. In the fact that they don't truly exist, but in the minds and fabrications of men, he alone is capital G O D. There is none else. Verse 3, oh give thanks to the Lord. Now we see capital L, small O, small R, small D, mm -hmm. of Lords, lowercase. And then this passage ends in verse 26. Who we'll give thanks unto the God of heaven. Once again, we are brought face to face with God's sovereignty. I know we looked at this last week, but I'm going to 
look at it again, Daniel chapter 4, and we're going to read verse 34 this time. The words of Nebuchadnezzar, the mightiest king at the time uh, that he reigned, the mightiest king on the earth, and he states, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes into heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. That's kind of verses 1 through 3 that we looked at in Psalm 136. Mm -hmm. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. He's the God of heaven. We saw that in the closing verse 26. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Our call to worship comes to worship a God that is truly sovereign, a God that is in eternally enduring in mercy toward us, a God that has revealed himself through creation, has revealed himself through our salvation and our deliverance, and he continues to provide for us day after day after day, even when we're at our lowest, verse 23, who remembered us in our lowest state, verse 24, redeemed us from our enemies, and then verse 25, who giveth food to all flesh, for his mercy endureth forever. We truly serve and worship a great God, and it is those, that thought, those verses, that call us to worship this morning, and we consider the greatness of our God, the greatness of his mercy, and we, the recipients of that. Take your hymnals now and turn with me to hymn 142, Blessed Redeemer. Hymn 142.
Thank you, Philip. And welcome. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. And I'm thankful to uh, uh, Don Russell for making me a little more presentable, having a coat to wear that I left at home as far as my own personal coat was concerned. Some things for you to be thinking about, prayer requests uh, that I want to bring before you. Sharon Berkheiser goes for surgery on Tuesday of this week, and I know would appreciate our prayers. We'll have uh, further word as to time of that surgery. I'll probably put that out on the uh, call them all once we hear from Keith concerning that time. And uh, then pray for uh, Mary Ellen Trees. She is going for surgery on the 15th of April. Uh, a redo on a knee surgery. So ask the Lord to guide her through this, protect her during that time, and to give a good result. If you've noticed in your bulletin, we are planning a work day on April 13, Saturday, and uh, that's weather permitting. An alternate date has been settled for the following Saturday on the 20th. So if there's inclement weather, on the 13th, then we'll look to the 20th of April to be able to gather together some things that can be used and done to spruce up uh, in the springtime. So we'll trust that there will be a good number of you who will be able to participate in that time. In just a few minutes after our scripture reading, I'd ask uh, Philip Berkheiser to give us an update on the uh, Deer King family and also then to lead in prayer. But first, what I'd like you to do is turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 21. Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, and then Matthew 27, verses 11 through 25. So if you've found your place at Matthew 21, would you please stand in reverence to God's word. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, under the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her, Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went, and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And then, if you would, Matthew 27, verses 11 through 25. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word. Insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. 
Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you? Barabbas? Or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas! Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Thank you. You may be seated. And Philip, if you would share with us an update and then read in prayer. As a refresher, um, this all started back in December. The Deer King family, David and Sierra, uh, David was originally from Lancaster County, but they, once he got married, he moved down to South Carolina. They were back um, in Pennsylvania right before Christmas to visit his family for the Christmas break. Um, their young son, Colton, got sick and was taken to the hospital. And then Sierra also became very ill and was taken to the hospital over the past four months. Um, she could have died that first week. She's gone through four amputations of all, both arms and both legs. And so pastor asked me for an update this morning and I'd like to take the updates from the, their Facebook page, Sierra and Colton updates as a, as a summary of what's been going on in the last two weeks. Going back to March 10th, I won't read everything because there's a lot here, but I'll try mm -hmm. to hit the highlights. Um, back on March 10th, Sierra has really struggled with her breathing trials the last couple of days. And there's a bunch of medical stuff here. There was some fluid in her lungs. She has been feeling a little down. Last night she spelled out, quotation marks, progress is so slow on the alphabet chart. Mm -hmm. This morning she cried and said she just wanted to go home. David reminded her that a few weeks ago she had three chest tubes and couldn't do breathing trials at all. Two weeks before that, she had been having surgeries. He encouraged her that she's been making great progress and said, I imagine two weeks from now will look different than it does now. Interestingly, that was two weeks ago and it does get slightly more positive as we go through. Um, that same update said two days ago, she was taken outside. They took her to the helipad on the roof of the hospital and she was smiling big. On March 12, two days later, after 74 days and 14 hours, Sierra finally left the ICU. She had been moved down one floor to the progressive care unit, and it'll be an intermediate step to the acute rehab facility. <coughs> they were excited about the next steps. On March 13th, and she had severe leg pain in her appendage. It was a 10 out of 10. Um, Sierra, in her tears, told David that she's sorry that she's sick and that he has to wait with her. The last few days have been very up and down emotionally. They had some really good talks via the, the alphabet chart, I understand. Mm -hmm. And she's had to work through a lot emotionally and physically. I really covet your prayers in this regard, David said. Um, later on in the day, her pain was down to a 5 out of 10 rating. Again, on the 14th, it was the same pain. Moving up to four days ago, uh, Sierra went to the ER to have a peg tube placed in her stomach. This will replace the feeding tube that's been her, in her nose since she first came to the hospital. The tube was only supposed to be short term. Um, when she was on the schedule for the procedure in Pennsylvania, she had a really high fever, so they had to postpone it. Mm -hmm. Then she was transferred to Charlotte 
and due to all the surgeries on her arms and legs, they kept moving it back. Which brings into the next bit of news. On Friday, they got approval from the insurance for her to go to an ITAC facility uh, termed as a long-term acute care. It's a bridge between the hospital and acute rehab where they eventually want to be. Quotation, please continue to pray for our mental and emotional well-being in addition to the physical needs. These are battles we fight every day. Hmm. And this has been an extremely challenging journey. Discouraging Discouragement has really set in as it feels like progress has really slowed down while getting off the ventilator. Please pray for wisdom for David and his family as they try to navigate and process all this. One of the biggest battles she is facing right now is pain and discomfort. It is a constant struggle to get her in a position where she is not in pain. All throughout the night, she needs nurses to come in and reposition her. He did not think she'd been able to get good sleep. There's a, a note later on that day, the church has graciously offered her to allow them to put the church address on here publicly for in light of the many requests that we received. I've noted that it's been posted back mm -hmm. on the board there at Sierra Deer King and care of Harvest Baptist Church in Rockville, South Carolina. So if you want to send them a note of encouragement, that address is on the back board. <coughs> One day ago, no, oh, I'm sorry, let me quick read through a posting two days ago by David's mother. Um, I've been reading through the book Chosen Gratitude by Nancy DeMoss Wolgamuth that Sierra had brought to Pennsylvania when they came at Christmas. As her mother-in-law, it brings great joy to my heart to be able to read it and to see the depth of Sierra's heart and the things she had underlined or marked in other ways in the book. David gave me permission to share some of these pictured here are their markings. I think their heart will be blessed. Um, and in the, the photographs, it showed that Sierra had underlined a paragraph in here saying, however, I've seen that if I am not ceaselessly vigilant about rejecting ingratitude and choosing gratitude, I all too easily get sucked into the undertow of life in a fallen world. I start focusing on what I don't have that I want or what I want that I don't have. My life starts to feel hard, wearisome, and overwhelming. And then the other one, I discovered that gratitude truly is my life preserver, even in the most turbulent waters. Choosing gratitude rescues me from myself and my runaway emotions. It buoys me on the grace of God and keeps me from drowning in what otherwise would be my natural bent towards doubt, negativity, discouragement, and anxiety. This was all preparing her for the journey that they are on now. A little bit more positive update from one day ago. Sierra had a good day yesterday. The procedure went well. Um, they described that PT did a lot of exercises with her arms and legs today. They also used a Velcro staff a strap to attach a toothbrush to her arm and she was able to brush her own teeth. Today, she also did a swallowing test and got to enjoy some gel ice cream that she'd wanted for five months. <laughs> and then the last one again from yesterday, uh, from David, just when I thought today couldn't get any better, respiratory was able to create a small leak in her trait cuff, which enabled her to use her vocal cords for a few minutes. It was so great to finally hear her voice after 85 days. So it's going to be a long journey, mm -hmm. as we're well aware, and they keep covering your prayers and see what happens in the future. It's a terrible situation that the Lord is using wondrously, mm -hmm. both here in LGH, when they were here at LGH, and then now that she's down in Charlotte, and wherever she moves on to the next step. So mm -hmm. let's uh, continue on in prayer, as mm -hmm. this pastor asked. So dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for how you're working in this terrible situation for your own glory. We thank you for how we've seen that you were preparing this young family to go through these trials and tribulations and 
how you were working through them to be a testimony to those that are interacting with them directly there in Charlotte, but also following along on this journey through social media and other matters. We do pray for David and Sierra, for their, their boys, Colton, and the other one that I don't remember, that both three and five years of age as they go through this. We ask, Lord, that you would give them grace and patience and to keep their focus on you in that everything that she and they are going through as a family has been prepared for in your own wonderful way and that you can use this not only to make them stronger but to and help others too that may go through similar situations in the future so lord we ask that you give them strength again patience and, and endurance through this time to help them through the the low points the valleys and to enjoy the the mountains as well and as they as they go through this continue to help them to be a testimony to those around them Lord, as we continue on in prayer, we think of the, the others in our church congregation that are unable to be here today for medical reasons as well, those that are sick today. And we pray for Sharon as she up, comes to this surgery on Tuesday, this ankle surgery that will lead to an extended um, rehab, both at home and, and through the hospital, and for Mary Ellen's surgery coming up on the 15th. For each and every one of those situations, there's there's worry and concern about what may happen or what is happening. And we thank you, Lord, that you are working through the lives of each and every one of them to give the doctors wisdom to perform the medical procedures to the best of their physical ability. And that in everything that you are the healing one and can provide healing, both physical and mental, as they deal with the frustrations of the rehab. We thank you for what you have done in the lives of the Deer King family and for the lives of our own church family here as they foresee these upcoming events and procedures. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Philip. Next time that we are tempted to complain about our circumstances, that's the Lord will remind us of this family going through some very serious things, but we're trusting that what Peter said will be true for them, that when they are tried and tested, they will come forth as gold. So continue to pray for that family, for the other situations that also here in our own congregation uh, are needful of our prayers, and may the Lord direct us for his glory. Philip, if you would, please. Song of the Month, Hymn 14, Arise My Soul, Arise, and I will ask you once again if you would arise with me and stand together and sing this hymn that takes us through very specifically Christ's suffering on Calvary and what he has done for us. Hymn 14, let's sing together. <laughs>
our Passover is sacrificed for us. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Under the blood, what a joyous truth we have in Christ Jesus, the provision that he has made. 65 years ago, 1959, in case you're doing the math, 
there was a popular song. I suppose it was a love song of sorts. And it was entitled, What a Difference a Day Makes. I want to call your attention to that simply because of the title. What a difference a day makes. But I want to make this slight change of wording and have us note it this morning. What a difference a week makes. In this instance, even less than a week. What a contrast exists between the events that we read of in Matthew chapter 21 and the events that we read of in chapter 27. You understand that when we come to this portion of Matthew's gospel, we are looking into the final hours of Jesus' life on earth. They're drawing near. He is going to the cross. And in Matthew 21, the cross is less than a week away. He's aware of that. The disciples are not fully aware of that, but he is aware of that. And in sharp contrast to the shame of the cross, because the cross was in the eyes of the people, a shameful death. It was, it was kept for the worst of criminals. And Jesus Christ was numbered with the transgressors. And he was placed in that position where his death would be upon the cross of Calvary. But in sharp contrast to that, the shame of the cross, we're looking in Matthew 21, into the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's described in all four Gospels. You turn to any one of them, Matthew chapter 11, as we read this morning, Mark chapter 11, Luke chapter 19, John chapter 12, and we read of that triumphal entry. And we need to be reminded and Matthew does that if we look at chapter 19 of Matthew, verses 1 and 2. Jesus had been ministering in Galilee, but we're told that it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, what is recorded in the previous chapter, chapter 18, he departed from Galilee and came into the coasts of Judea beyond Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. And when it tells us that he came into the coasts of Judea beyond Jordan, speaking of beyond Jordan, it is the country, uh, the area known as Perea, the country beyond is what that word means. It was a term that was used mainly during the early Roman period for part of ancient Transjordan. In other words, on the east side of the Jordan River and looking into the Jordanian or the Transjordan highlands that were visible there and in an area that was just located, started just below the Sea of Galilee and extended about halfway down the sea, the, the Dead Sea, that area is where this is speaking of. And it lay broadly east of Judea and Samaria. Those were situated on the western side of the Jordan River and southwest of the Decapolis. Perea was part of the kingdom of Herod the Great and his descendants and later of uh, subsequent Roman provinces that included Judea. By the time we get to chapter 20 of the book of Matthew, we see Jesus heading to Jerusalem. If you turn to Matthew 20 and verse 17, and Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the 12 disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, 
and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. In Matthew 21, verses 1 through 3, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage, under the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. Ellicott, in his commentary, says of this section, Here again we have as far as we can to fill up a gap in St. Matthew's Gospel. That is an area of details that Matthew doesn't cover. We have to think of the journey up the narrow valley that leads from Jericho to Jerusalem. That was the approach that Jesus would have made at this point with his disciples from Jericho and then climbing toward Jerusalem up through that narrow valley. Our Lord, as before, was followed by the disciples. And they, in their turn, were followed by the crowds of pilgrims who were drawn to the holy city either by the coming Passover or by wonder and curiosity to see what part the prophet of Nazareth would take. Throughout the multitude, including the disciples, there was a feverish expectation that he would at last announce himself as the Christ and claim his kingdom. We know that was on the heart of the people for Luke records in Luke chapter 19 and verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So here you have the swelling tide of people that are gathered with Christ and they are thinking in terms of what is coming as far as the establishment of the kingdom and they are there for the passover there is a swelling of the numbers of people in jerusalem at this point and so they are approaching that place and expecting what he is going to do that he will claim his kingdom and indeed there is an offer of the king here that the people will in only a few days reject. They reach Bethany six days before the Passover, probably on Friday afternoon. They remain there for the Sabbath, probably in the house of Lazarus or maybe Simon the leper. And we're told in John chapter 12, verse one, then six days before the Passover, they came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. So we have four accounts, as I've noted, four accounts of the triumphal entry. They differ in some respects, but they are not contradictory. God clearly brings them together through the viewpoint of each of the apostles or those who wrote John was written 60 years after the event. 60 years beyond the event that took place. But he gives some of the most incredible details and the most interesting details. In fact, he's the one who tells us that the night before, Jesus had an intimate supper in the home of Lazarus and Martha and Mary. John records it in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. So here we are now, first day of the week, <clears throat> Palm Sunday, as we noted today, and Jesus sent two unnamed disciples to Bethphage, near Bethany. Bethphage was a village that apparently, from what we're told here, was near to Bethany. We don't know with certainty the location of that uh, town today, 
But what we do know is that at this point, the triumphal entry took place. If there was any question, as these two disciples went to carry out the Lord's directions, his commands, his orders concerning bringing uh, the donkey and her colt, the Lord said, if there's any question, just tell them the Lord hath need of them. Now, Luke says that the question was asked. Matthew doesn't record that. Luke does, however, but it didn't stop from borrowing those two animals. In Matthew, there's no question. The question is not recorded, but he records, as the others do not, that there were two animals. That there was the foal, the colt, and there was the uh, mother of that colt. And he also calls attention to the precise fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy, which is quoted. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, and included with that and prefaced by the phrase from Isaiah 62, verse 11, which says, tell ye the daughter of Zion. Now, if we go back to Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, we read these words. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Matthew 21, verse 5, includes that thought from Isaiah 62, 11, Tell ye the daughter of Sion. Tell ye the daughter of Sion. And in Isaiah 62, verse 11, we're told, Behold, the Lord saith, proclaimed, hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. We also note one of the details that Matthew omits from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, the phrase, O daughter of Jerusalem. Instead, he makes reference to Zion. That's a reference to a specific hill in Jerusalem. The exact location of that specific hill in Jerusalem is disputed today. But it was a place, a geographical location. And Zion is often used as a title for Jerusalem itself. There's no need to spiritualize Zion. No need to make it represent the church. This thought and this expression of Zion is a geographic location and it's related to the king and the kingdom. But the main point, the main point on that day contained in the quotation of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9 is that the Messiah king of Israel, unlike earthly kings, would come in a lowly manner. He would offer himself to the nation in a lowly, meek manner. And we're told that he would be sitting upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass. Kings didn't come to Israel in that manner. That was not the norm. That was not what was anticipated if a king was coming. Kings usually came on horses, a mighty steed. Revelation chapter 19 gives us a bit of an insight into that when we think of the coming of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be revealed to the world and to Israel who had rejected him. Revelation 19 verse 11, And I saw heaven open. 
and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's, of course, no question as to who is being shown to us. The person of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he who truly is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Matthew ignores some of the details. For his emphasis is on the fulfillment of prophecy. He's not concerned with painting the full picture for us of what took place on that day. He's not trying to minutely show us. He's not crossing his T's and dotting his I's with detail so that you and I can say, wow. But he is pointing us toward the fulfillment of prophecy concerning the coming of Jesus as a king to Jerusalem. That's what he wants to point out to us. That's what he wants us to see. That's what he wants his readers to know. And so he simply records that the disciples brought the ass and the colt, and they put garments on both of them, though we're told in the details as we correlate all the scripture passages that he sat only on the colt, a colt that was never ridden before, showing his power, his supremacy, his sovereignty over even the creatures that were included in this event. He's proceeding to Jerusalem. And he's, he's accompanied by a crowd. And it's a crowd that is familiar with the raising of Lazarus, John chapter 11. Remember? Standing outside that tomb and there crying out, Lazarus, come forth! And it's been well said that had he not said Lazarus, he would have emptied the whole graveyard. They would have recognized the power and the voice of the Son of God. But he has a crowd that's coming with him. They're accompanying him, a multitude of people, and they're familiar with this raising of Lazarus. And on the way, they're met by another multitude that's coming out of the city. So you have the joining of these two groups. And both groups were seeking to outdo themselves in honoring him. So as the scene unfolds for us in the various passages and they're brought together, they cut down branches. John tells us they were palm branches, thus Palm Sunday. They were treating Jesus as their king but they only had partial understanding. They didn't fully comprehend, just as his disciples did not fully comprehend when he said, we're going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of those that will kill him, put him to death. But in three days, he'll rise from the dead. Those are things that passed over the heads of the disciples. And here with the people, oh yes, Hosanna to the son of David, 
but there's only a partial understanding. They don't fully comprehend what is taking place, what is happening. John tells us about it. John chapter 12 and verse 16. These things understood not his disciples at the first. As they look at what's taking place, they listen to the crowds, they see the multitude, they consider the things that are being said, but they didn't understand at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. So here you have a crowd those that knew of the raising of Lazarus, accompanying Jesus. You have an approaching crowd coming out of the city, perhaps many of the pilgrims that had come for the Passover, and they are joined together, and they fulfill the prophecies of just such an entry into Jerusalem. Again, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And they addressed Jesus with these amazing words. Matthew 21, verse 9. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So what are they saying? That term, Hosanna, it's the transliteration of a Hebrew expression meaning grant salvation. Hosanna, Hosanna, grant salvation. But it's used here, it's used here as a greeting. They're greeting the one whom they see as a king and thinking in terms of his setting up his kingdom now. It's an expression of praise. Hosanna! As they join together and bring him into then the city. And the most significant thing is the reference to Christ as the son of David. They recognize that he is in the kingly line. Although it seems clear that they don't seem to have entered fully into the concept that he was entering into Jerusalem at this very moment as its king. Would they recognize their king? Would they accept their king? Would they honor their king? So he's coming into Jerusalem. Both multitudes are with him, accompanying him. And the multitude which met him are confronted by still others who ask the question, who is this? Again, you have pilgrims gathered from all over the land and out of the land who have come to celebrate Passover in the city of Jerusalem. And so they are looking on, they're seeing the tumult that is raised by those who are familiar with this man who is coming, and they ask the question, who is this? You see, Matthew indicates that the entire city was excited by the arrival of Jesus, and the multitude answer those who are questioning, who is this? And they say, this is Jesus. He's the prophet of Nazareth, of Galilee. And it's very possible. It's very possible in those who accompanied him coming up through that valley on their approach to Jerusalem, it's very possible that those multitudes included pilgrims from Galilee for the Feast of Passover. And so they proudly claim Jesus we want you to see this one. This is Jesus of Nazareth, of Galilee. He's the prophet. They want them to recognize that, and they are proud to claim him as their own. 
And the form of the word said in verse 11, when they said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, of Galilee, the form of that word indicates that they repeated this information again and again. They kept, they, they kept saying, proclaiming, declaring their proud declaration, he's Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, of Galilee. Matthew doesn't record the details that followed that day. It was probably Sunday afternoon when Jesus came into Jerusalem. Mark tells us in Mark chapter 1, in chapter 11 and verse 11, and Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about <clears throat> upon all things, <clears throat> and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. He did not at this point cleanse the temple. He looked in the temple, which significantly Matthew calls the temple of God. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 12. And then he went out to Bethany with the twelve to spend the night. The casting out of the money changers of the temple occurred the next day, Monday morning. We're told in chapter 21 of Matthew, verses 12 through 17. But now here's the question. As we think of what a difference a week makes, how do we go from Hosanna, the son of David, to what we read in Matthew 27 and in John's Gospel. Listen to the words of John as he records in John 19, verses 1 through 15. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Remember, this is less than a week after Hosanna! to the son of David. Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. And Pilate therefore heard that saying. He was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then said Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not? Speakest thou not? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from henceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. And Pilate 
therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement. It was a tiled area, checkered in nature, and it was the place where the tribunal would sit to give judgment. In the place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover. And about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold, your king! But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. When I read that passage of scripture and hear the cries of crucify him, crucify him, let him be crucified. I think back nearly 50 years ago, participating in a cantata at the church where I was pastoring. And the, the strength of that passage is brought home again and again as I think of two groups of people that were singing during that cantata and one of them expressing that this was the Messiah and the other crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And the power of that, that even as we read it here in the scriptures, can you imagine being in that place at that time hearing those words, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate saying, why? What evil hath he done? Even as the crowd cried, let him be crucified. What is it that brings us to this point? Well, surely we can say it is the work of the enemy. Satan seeking to thwart the purpose of God in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, seeking to prevent the plan of God from moving forward. He can only see Christ dying and defeated, no hope of redemption for mankind. If I can only kill the Messiah, then I bring God's plan to absolute ruin. But he doesn't deal with the plan and the purpose of God. The plan and the purpose of God is that prophecy be fulfilled. Those things that God has spoken will be accomplished. The promises of God will be fulfilled. And what looked like defeat actually proved to be victory. As you look at those two situations, the crowds welcoming Jesus on Palm Sunday and the mob demanding his death by only a few days later. In the first case, you had what we would refer to as the crowds. They're exuberant but they're under control. They're praising the one who was truly the king of Israel. And so they are fulfilling the definition of a crowd, a large number of persons, especially when they are collected together. A group of people having something such as a habit or an interest or an occupation in common and they have come together with a common purpose here is the Messiah here is the King of Israel here is the one we want to receive but only a few days hence you have not a crowd you have a mob you have those who are unruly and demanding and deadly the gathering of a large and disorderly crowd of people bent on riotous, destructive action against 
the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who truly is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. It's a gloomy picture until we approach the following first day of the week. And Jesus Christ proves to be victorious. And the plan of Satan is defeated. And you and I now have a message of hope to give to the world around us. Yes, Christ died, but he died for our sins, and he died according to the scriptures. And yes, he literally died. He was placed in the tomb. His body was seen. Even the Roman soldiers who were accustomed to death and would make no mistake in pronouncing, he is dead, testified to that. So he was buried, but the scriptures tell us that he rose again the third day, and all of that in accordance with God, what God revealed in his word. And next week, next Sunday, next Lord's Day, we will celebrate that very fact. But these preparations that were made here. God wants us to see and understand that he has sent his son. He will fulfill his purpose. He will rise from the dead and he will someday be welcomed by the Israel of God as the Messiah. They'll look upon the one whom they have pierced and they will mourn as a father mourns for his only son. What a savior we have. And what a privilege to today recognize that what they were crying was true. Hosanna to the son of David. He truly is the Messiah. And he's the one that would redeem not only Israel, not only be for the people of God, but he is a light unto the Gentiles. You and I are called to be his ambassadors, to be his witnesses, to declare who he is and what he has provided through his shed blood. Oh, may we with boldness declare that message even during this season of the year. We have a great deal to be thankful for. And we have a great God whom we serve. Philip, if you would, please. As we close our service, take your hymnals once again. Turn to hymn 13. Crown him with many crowns. King of kings and lord of lords. He is risen victorious and is one day coming soon for us. In 13, let's stand together and sing.
Father, we long for that day when he shall indeed be crowned King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Father, may we, as the recipients of a message of hope, of joy, of peace, of salvation, be faithful as your servants to declare that truth to the peoples of the world. Lord, make us your witnesses in our own families, in our own neighborhoods, in our own county, in our own state, in our own nation, and indeed to the peoples of the world, that Christ may be claimed as the Redeemer, and then, Father, one day, one day, crowned as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and he will rule upon this earth with a rod of iron, but he will be a righteous, just, Ruler. Thank you, O Father, for the marvelous blessings of the gospel. Thank you for the truths of your word. And thank you for the gathering of the saints to worship you. We come in that precious, precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.